This is my first time at Boswell. Um, what a great bookstore. You guys are so lucky. I hope you understand really what a gem you have in your midst here. And I hope every time you think, uh, I think I'm going to get a book for Aunt Jenny, you always think Boswell, and you never think Amazon. <laughs> Um, how many of you have never read a Cork O'Connor mystery novel? Okay. No. Why are you here? <laughs> okay. So you've heard about Ordinary Grace? Yes. You've heard about Ordinary Grace? All right. Well, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Cork O'Connor, and then I'll talk about Ordinary Grace. I'm best known as the author of the Cork O'Connor Mystery Series, which is set in the great north woods of Minnesota. My protagonist is, uh, is the former sheriff of the fictional Tamarack County, Minnesota. He's a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish and he's part of the uh, Because of that mixture in his heritage, and largely because of the area in which I've chosen to set my novels, northern Minnesota, a lot of the stories that I write come from issues that arise out of the interface of those two cultures, white and Ojibwe. So I've written about Indian gaming casinos and the effect that that's had both on the Ojibwe community and the surrounding white community. I've written about uh, the ongoing battle over the over hunting and fishing treaty rights, which is something Wisconsin folks know a lot about. Uh, I've written about the battle over the cutting of sacred pine trees, uh, the influx of the drug and gang cultures on the reservation. Always at some level in my work, I deal with the whole question of racial prejudice. There are currently 12 books in that series. For those of you who are interested, the 13th book in the Corp O'Connor series is due out in August. It's a novel called Tamarack County. It is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's typically what I'm known for, but I'm here to talk about a different book today. Um, I don't know how many of you deal with teenagers on a regular basis. Uh, for me, they're the toughest audience I ever address. But I'm often asked to speak to high school students about writing, the whole writing process thing. So I was asked uh, last spring to speak to a group of high school students, actually the whole, the whole high school, uh, down in Southwestern, rural school in Southwestern Minnesota. And, uh, and so I, I did my regular spiel, and I don't know, if you deal with teenagers on a regular basis, you know that it doesn't matter how compelling what you're telling them they might really think is, they always look at you like, oh God, what planet did you come from? So I did my regular spiel and I'm looking at these kids who's, <laughs> who all look at me like they'd rather be having a stick poked in their eye instead of listening to me. And when I finished the, the talk and I opened it up for question and answer, and the first question to me came from a young lady in the front row. She raised her hand and I said, yeah, and she said, this was her question to me. How old are you? <laughs> so I had to nod a little bit and, uh, and finally confessed that I'm 62 years old. And then when the assembly broke up and they all went their separate ways, she came up and she explained to me the reason for her question. She was a writer. And she wanted to know how long it was going to take her <laughs> to make her living as a writer. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to break her heart. So I, so I told her what I tell all of my students when, uh, when they come to my writing classes. You know, patience, be patient. When the time is right, it will come to you. I'm telling you that story because uh, really what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is it's largely predicated on the fact that I'm 62 years old. And I want to talk to you about how at 62 years of age I've seen two important journeys in my life converged in a very satisfying way. I've seen my journey as a writer and my spiritual journey um, come together in just an, an amazing way, an amazing way. And, uh, and it's a book called Ordinary Grace. I don't know when your first inkling might have come to you, or the way in which it came to you, that there's a great deal more to the world than we can see with our eyes. For me, it was when I was six years old, and it came as the result of seeing a movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man. <laughs> Anybody here remember The Incredible Shrinking Man? Okay, okay. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, The Incredible Shrinking Man was one of those great science fiction movies that, uh, that uh, came out during the 1950s and uh, was all over the big screens. Um, the Incredible Shrinking Man was really a couple of steps above your typical great science fiction movie, largely because it was based on a story by the really great Richard Matheson. Um, star guy named Grant Williams, 
Yeah, his career shrank to nothing after this movie. <laughs> Uh, what happened in the uh, in the Greenwich Street Commandment is simply this: a guy is out on his uh, his boat off the coast of California. He happens to pass through this mysterious luminous mist, which of course turns out to be a radioactive mist because everything in the Greeby science fiction movies back in the fifties was the result of radioactivity. So a couple of years after he passed, a couple of days after he passes through that uh, that luminous mist, he begins to shrink, and as he gets smaller and smaller, his perspective of the world changes. Um, so he gets down, you know, to the size of the munchkins in the Wizard of Oz, and he hangs out with little people, and he sees the world as the little people see the world, and then he gets smaller and smaller, and gets to the point where the family cat who used to look to him as food looks at him, looks to him for food, looks at him as food. Um, he gets even smaller, and finally reaches the point where he battles a spider over a dropped birthday crumb, a crumb from a birthday cake. Near the end of the movie, he gets so small that he slips out through the, the window screen and enters the world outside. And right at the end of the movie, he steps into an existence on a molecular level. And do you know what he discovers there? There's a universe there too. So when I walked out of that movie, what I understood was that existence was probably a great deal smaller and a great deal larger and a great deal more mysterious than I was ever going to be able to grasp.